guess I am. <clears throat> Good morning. And uh, happy Feast of Tabernacles. Today is the first uh, holy day. Uh, well, there's only one holy day in the Feast of Tabernacles. Only one. And uh, But there is an eighth day which follows the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is a totally separate holy day and is not part of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, sometimes... <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll hear Protestant pastors like Perry Stone and, and others who will tell you that there's eight days to the Feast of Tabernacles, but there isn't. There's only seven days, and we're going to take a look at that in the Bible. Now, the real conditions we see in the millennium, I'm not going to cover that much today. I may just introduce it, but basically the conditions that we see in the millennium uh, there's so much in the book of Isaiah about that that I'm going to wait till till this coming Sabbath to talk about it. Uh, so today I want to give you an introduction as to what the Feast of Tabernacles is. Why should we be here, uh, you know, in the middle of the week? This is not a weekend, so why are we here? Because God told us to be, and we who are here are obedient to God. Let's ask God's blessing. I need that, and then we're going to get into this. Father, we ask your blessing, your anointing on the teaching and on the hearing. And let those who, who hear this message today have a much deeper understanding than they ever have before. Help them to appreciate it and appreciate the fact that you've commanded us to observe these holy days so that we can have a deeper understanding of your master plan. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So why are we here today? Well, we're here for one reason. You are here to honor God through your obedience. You're not here to honor me. You're not here to honor a church. You're here to honor a God, plain and simple. God said, do it. That's the reason you're here. Now, if you got your Bibles, you know what I did? Would you? Yeah. I've been running around so much here, I left it open there. Um, <clears throat> if you've got your Bibles, turn to Exodus 23. This is the first place where we see God ex explicitly talking. Hey, Steve. <laughs> talking about the, the holy days, Exodus 23, um, let's see here, now the old covenant consists of only four chapters, Exodus 20 through 23, the actual covenant chapters, those four chapters, now chapter 23, verse 14 says, three times, you shall keep a feast to me in the year. Verse 15, you're to keep the feast of unleavened bread, which Luke 22, 1 says, then came the days of unleavened bread, which are called the Passover. So this is just another name for Passover. Uh, Passover is not one day like some people think. It's not the 14th. The New Testament calls the 14th the preparation day. Preparation for what? For the feast of the Passover. Uh, John chapter 13 verse 1 refers to the days of unleavened bread as the feast of the Passover. And then Ezekiel 45 verse 21 says you shall have the Passover, comma, a feast of seven days. So don't let anybody deceive you and tell you that the 14th is the Passover and that that's a feast. And then the days of unleavened bread are the second feast. That's, that's pure hogwash. My mother used to tell me, don't say that on radio. Well, it's a good theological term, hogwash, because, I mean, the stuff that people come up with is crazy. So Passover is the name of the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. Usually, Unleavened Bread, seven days, that I command you in the time of the month, Abib. That's, if you look in the margin, it'll say April. Uh, verse 16, the second major festival, there's only, well, there are three festivals, three festival seasons, I should say. The Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labor. So that's Pentecost. And then it says in the Feast of End Gathering, which is at the end of the year, the end of the harvest year, when you've gathered in the labors out of your field. Now, when somebody uh, says, well, we don't have to do that. That's only for the Jews. Uh, not, uh, Exodus 12, verse 49 says, the same laws I gave to Israel, the strangers are to obey also. And then, in fact, uh, in Numbers 15, let me look this up and read it to you. I believe it's verse 15. Yeah. Numbers 15, 15 says, One ordinance shall be both for you, of the congregation, the Israelites, and also for the stranger, that's the Gentile, the sojourns with you, an ordinance forever in your generations. Here's the ordinance that's forever. As you are, the Israelite, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. 
It is not true that, that these holy days were only given to the Jews. One law, verse 16, and one manner shall be for you and for the stranger that sojourns with you. Now, you can't make the people in China or Japan obey these laws, but you can. Those who live in the nation, they're supposed to keep the same law. So God didn't say, no, wait a minute, you're a Gentile. Don't you do this now. This, this, you're, not, you're a Gentile. You're not allowed to do this. No, no, that's not the case at all. We are supposed to obey God, whether we're Jew or Gentile. And that's, that, that's very plain from Numbers 15, verses 15 and 16. Now, I want you to know something else about these harvests or these festivals. They are harvest festivals. The feast were centered around actual harvest from the field. But they symbolized the spiritual harvest of souls in the kingdom of God. They symbolized the spiritual harvest of souls in the kingdom of God. Um, I'm, I'm coming back here to the Old Testament, but let me read to you what Jesus said in John chapter 4. We're letting the Bible interpret itself. And in John chapter 4, the disciples, starting in verse 31, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed and said, Master, eat. He hadn't had lunch yet. He said, I have meat to eat that you don't know of. You don't know anything about it. But he said, he said, I have meat or food to eat that you don't know anything about. And they said, has anybody brought him anything to eat? Jesus said, verse 34, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. My meat, my food. It's like my meat and potatoes to obey God. And to finish his work. Now, verse 35 is very important. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Now, they're thinking about the harvest, the literal harvest of, you know, whatever they got out there, barley or wheat or whatever it would, would have been. Now, some theologians, I checked several commentaries on this, some theologians believe that this has probably happened in December or January, and it's talking about the barley harvest in April, and, and, uh, and then later, of course, the wheat harvest in June. That's what they're thinking. So this may have occurred in December. We don't know. But Jesus said, do you not say there are yet four months before the harvest? And then, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, it's interesting. More than one commentary and Bible reference says these were the Samaritans that, that the woman there in, at the well had told them about Jesus. And while he was talking, here comes hundreds of Samaritans toward him wearing their white turbans and he says look at the fields are white to harvest so that's why some of the commentaries think I don't know if that's true or not because I wondered what white meant so I I've never understood why he said they're white to harvest but that's what some of the commentaries will tell you uh, so I looked up the word white in the dictionary and it told me it meant white so so that didn't help very much <clears throat> and he that reaps receives wages that's money compensation and gathers fruit, but notice, to life eternal. So Jesus is talking about eternal life. We're harvesting human souls into the kingdom of God so they can have eternal life. That both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. And here is that saying, true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you, the apostles, to reap that whereon you bestow no labor. In other words, the Jews had already promulgated the scriptures or synagogues all over the place. And, and uh, all they did was go into the established synagogues and tell them about Jesus. So, so God had already prepared the way for the gospel. Other men labored, and you are entered into their labor. Same thing is true today. Uh, I tell people, go buy you a Bible and come here and study the Bible. Well, somebody else had to go to the trouble of publishing these Bibles, or else we couldn't have a Bible school. So you see, I'm entering into the labors of these other people. The point I'm making here is Jesus compared the physical harvest of barley and wheat and then to have the fruit harvest at this time of the year. He compared it to human souls. That's what you want to keep in mind. So these harvests, this Feast of Tabernacles, pictures a harvest of souls coming in at the time of the end. Now I want to go back to Leviticus because I told you I was going to go back there. Are there any questions? Deborah, it's good to see you today. Good I was thinking about you yesterday because I hadn't, hadn't seen you in a while. Mm -hmm. 
Glad you're here. You Doing fine, I think. Okay, so uh, Leviticus 23, verse 2, God says, These are my feast. Now, Purim is a Jewish feast. It's not one of God's feasts. Hanukkah is not a feast of the Lord. That's a Jewish feast. They're welcome to it. But these are the feasts that God created to give not just to the Jews, but to all the nation of Israel and to the stranger that sojourns among you. So if we're going to worship the God of Israel, we need to keep the same festivals. For, okay, I'll take it in just a moment. These are the feasts of the Lord, verse 4, holy convocations to convoke an assembly. If it's a holy convoked assembly, that's what we call church service. Then in verse 6, you have the first holy day, the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then you have the wave sheet, verses 10 through 14, which is not the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits is Pentecost. The wave sheaf is a work day, and you start your count from the wave sheaf. In verse 15, you count seven Sabbaths, and there's a Sabbath every seven days, so that's 49 <laughs> days. Verse 16, you, you add the 50th day, and that's Pentecost. All right, any, uh, and then we're going to look at the holy days now. What's the question first? It says, will, will you have the willow of the brook and the noble fruit, or will just be taking up a collection part, taking up a collection part of these feasts? Because it seems to me that we leave that off a lot. Uh, I do not emphasize the money part. Now, David Cirillo of the Inspiration Network, he teaches on the holy days. I, get, I haven't watched him in years now because I got sick of looking at the wall, the wall of Waltons. I was about to say the Waltonsies. The, the Waltons. Uh, <clears throat> he takes up money so they can play the Waltons all the time. But he would talk, but when the feast days would come, he'd always talk about it. But all he talked about was send me money, send me money, send me money, send me money. Uh, he didn't say take off from work, come to church, well, they're right down there in Charlotte. They could have a great big feast down there, but they're not doing it. Instead, they're after the people's money. We do not, and I have never in 35 years have I ever passed a plate. But part of our blessing is on our offering. And, the, and people are told to give an offering. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, it says, when you come to these three feasts, you are to bring an offering. So that is part of the command. And I'm glad the person brought it up. Uh, let me read it to you. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord. And I'm going to come back to that. What does he mean, males? In the place where he shall choose, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before me empty. Every man shall give as he is able, that's over and above the tithe, according to the blessing of the Lord your God. So God does require us to give an offering. But I don't emphasize the offering. I emphasize the holy day. Uh, David Cirillo, to him, I think he turns to God's holy days into gimmicks to try to raise money, and I despise that. And we also never pass a plate here anyway. We have a box back there where people yeah. can drop in their offerings and their tithes if they so choose. We don't wave a plate under your nose. Yeah, nobody's obligated. They give as they're able and give as they want to. Do you have a... Yeah, um, I addressed this question in the comments, but you might want to just say something about okay. it too. It says, will you be putting up a sukkah and dwelling in them? Yeah, a sukkah, that's some Hebrew word that means a tabernacle or a booth. Uh, <clears throat> I was just describing that before we actually started the service. God wants us to do that. And if we had at least 100 people, we would have the biggest camp meeting you've ever seen. But when we have a small group and we don't know who's going to come, we can't do that. Because if we did, nobody would show up but me. Carolyn and I would be there. Y'all might. I don't know. Y'all might. <laughs> But uh, but the thing is, uh, when I first, my very first Feast of Tabernacles, there were 8,000 people celebrating it down in southern Georgia, right on, right on the beach. We put up a, a big tent that would seat at least 8,000 people, a big circus tent. And they had a huge stage, and they have an organ on one side and a, a, a grand piano on the other, and they'd be playing together. And we have a 100-member in the choir, 100-member people, 100-member choir. 100 people in the choir. And so they were singing the hallelujah chorus. Man, you get all excited. Now, that's the way the Feast of Tabernacles ought to be done. And I was just saying last night to our class that um, in the 15 years that this college has existed, we've had just under 300 people that have gone through uh, the, this college. And if all of them had accepted God's holy days, we would have the biggest shindig you've ever seen in Kannapolis. Yeah, we would have what he's calling a sukkah or a, a literal... And what, what that is, a booth is a tent. It could be a camping trailer. It could be a hotel 
dwelling. It could even be a hotel it's room. A temporary dwelling. Yeah, it just means a temporary dwelling. And so, in fact, the way they did it in, in biblical times, they put a little booth on top of the roof of their house. Or so we could go down here to the big hotel on Speedway Boulevard and rent that resort out. Yeah, we rent the whole resort, yeah. So, yeah, in fact, there's a campground uh, not too far from here that would make a perfect place if we all wanted to camp out for a week. Then I won't show up because I'm not getting dirty at the campsite. Well, <laughs> but that's what I did my first year. I actually stayed in a tent uh, for the whole week. So, yes, we'd like to do that, but with, with a small group, it's... We're not going to be able to do it. So, but we do just observe the holy days. So, yes, uh, let's go back to uh, Leviticus 23 now. So then the fall holy days, now there's a long time between Pentecost and trumpets. There, there, the last holy day to be fulfilled was the Feast of Trump, uh, Pentecost <coughs> in Acts chapter 2. But now the next holy day is trumpets, and that's never been fulfilled. Trumpets pictures the second coming of Jesus, and that has not been fulfilled. Now, Pat Robertson, the head of the Christian Broadcasting Network and one-time presidential candidate in 1988, he says, I observe the fall holy days because they have not been fulfilled. But he does not observe the spring holy days because they were fulfilled. Well, he's technically correct. They were fulfilled by Christ and by the church. Uh, you know, but here's the thing. Paul continued to keep the spring holy days, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, verse 8. You see that he continued to keep Passover. He continued to keep Pentecost, even after they were fulfilled. Now, it is true, though, the fall holy days have not been fulfilled. Why is it that the whole church world then isn't keeping these fall holy days? Trumpets has not been fulfilled because Jesus hasn't come back yet. The Day of Atonement, when Satan is put away and the whole world is reconciled or atoned to God, that has not been fulfilled. How come the churches don't keep it? They don't want to. That's the bottom line. They don't want to. Now, verse, 20, verse 24, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath. That's an annual Sabbath. A memorial blowing of trumpets. Do no servile work. We observe that. Uh, 15 days ago, two weeks ago, and then this past uh, Saturday, the, the verse 27, the 10th day, fell on a Saturday this year, and we afflicted our souls on that day. And then God tells us in verse 31, these days are forever, they're a statute forever. Now let's go to the Feast of Tabernacles in verse 34. Speak to the children of Israel, the 15th day of the seventh month, and the word month, Kodesh, in Hebrew means new moon. This, uh, this month, the seventh new moon from spring, uh, made this the month when the holy days fall. So you count seven new moons, uh, beginning with the first new moon of spring. And I'm not the only one that teaches that. The Sanhedrin in Israel teach that today. They teach it. The 15th day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for, notice, seven days to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Today's the first day. Today's a holy convocation. So what we're doing here today is holy. And you're to do no servile work. It's a Sabbath. We're not to go out and work today. Verse 36, seven days you're an offering, off, made an, uh, have an offering made by fire. Now, don't you dare do that because you're violating the law if you do. This offering made by fire was roasting an animal to eat. And you can't do that anywhere outside of Jerusalem on planet Earth. And you can't do it if you lived in Jerusalem. It's got to be a priest who does it. So if you set up an altar in your backyard and you offer up an offering made by fire, you are transgressing the law. You're well, violating the law. Scripture, because it doesn't say here that it's a priest. Yeah, you have to go to all the other scriptures like uh, Leviticus 17, for example. Uh, there's uh, and some other scriptures too, which let me see, I can maybe give you a few more on that. Um, let me see here. I don't have a specific... Uh, Numbers 16, verse 40, and also Deuteronomy 16. I can give you more scriptures later, but you can look those up to get you started. Yeah, you and I cannot offer the offerings made by fire. Those offerings are animal sacrifices, which if you offer an animal sacrifice anywhere outside of Jerusalem, you are transgressing God's law, and that's a sin. So, verse 36, seven days you're, you're an offering, offering made by fire. Now, he says you. Because you see, this is written in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. And so, 
And so the, the book of Leviticus is for the priests who are to teach Israel. But the priests did the offerings, and Israel did the coming together and having the holy convocations, which we're doing today. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation, but that's not part of the seven days. The eighth day is not a part of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you've gotten your information from people like Perry Stone, and there are a few others that teach it, you haven't heard him teach this. He says there are seven feast days. The first two days, the, the first two holy days found in the Passover. Then you have, he calls the wave sheep the third feast. The wave sheep is a, a day of work. It's not a feast day. You learn about the wave sheep in Leviticus 23, verses 10 through 14. It's not a holy convocation. It's not called a Sabbath. It's not called a holy day. It's not called a day of doing no servile work. It is simply a work day when they would take off, um, not take off from work, but the, the, the high priest would have three men to take off from what they were doing. Those three Levites would go out here and harvest an omer of barley Saturday evening at sundown, bring it to the priest, and the next morning he'd wave it. That was all that was done. And we also use that day as a day of demarcation to know when to start counting to Pentecost. Yeah, that's all it's for. You count to Pentecost from that day. But it's not a holy day. Perry Stone, bless his heart, is getting on television and teaching out of ignorance. I used to think maybe he kept the holy days because he'd teach on them all the time. And then I began listening to what he was teaching. I said, that boy didn't keep holy days. If he kept the holy days, he wouldn't be teaching. But here's what I'm saying. He makes the wave sheep the third holy day. He makes Pentecost the fourth holy day. Then he says, Trumpus is the next one, Day of Atonement. And the last one is Feast of Tabernacles. But what about, what's his eighth day? He totally leaves that out because he's ignorant. He ought not, I've been meaning to write him a letter for years. If I thought he'd read it, I would have already written him, but his mail readers will get it, and he won't read it. But I feel like saying, listen, before you get on national television and teach this stuff, why don't you at least read it first before you try to teach it? Psalm 111, verse 10, a good understanding have all they that do, not those who just read about it. So you got to do it to have a good understanding. This is my 48th Feast of Tabernacles. Now, so... On the eighth day, verse 36, shall be a holy convocation. They're to offer an offering. The Levites did that. The priests did that. It's a solemn assembly. Do no servile work. Now, verse 37, these are the feast of the Lord. Now, Purim is the feast of the Jews. Uh, that, that is to say it's a Jewish feast. Nothing wrong with it. Hanukkah is a Jewish feast. I don't know. Don't ask me anything about it. I don't, I'm not a Jew. But these are God's feast, which you shall proclaim holy convocations. Uh, verse 39, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land. Now, nobody in this room is a farmer, professionally, that I know of. Anybody here a professional farmer, career farmer? If you were a farmer, this would make a lot more sense to you. My grandpa raised 14 kids as a farmer. He grew cotton, primarily. But any farmer who deals with, you know, the crops, you know, eating wheat and all the things that, you, that farmers grow, Everything from watermelon, strawberries, and, and then in the fall you have the fruit harvest. You got apples and all these things. Well, any farmer knows that this time of the year, you're, you've, you've basically by now you've gathered in the harvest. And so God says, now when you get all that food together, you got to do something with it, don't you? Well, let's eat. God says, let's eat. And that's what this feast is about. It's not just getting together and going to church. It's having a a festive time. Now, if we did it the way. God wants us to do it, there'd be dancing and parting and rejoicing and celebrating and worshiping God seven days. In fact, the Jews had so much fun keeping one of God's festivals, they said, this is so good, let's take counsel to do it another seven days. And they did it another seven days. God's feasts are not a yoke of bondage, they're fun. In fact, every year where I would gather together with thousands of other people, when the last day came, people would have tears in their eyes and they didn't want to go home. That's how much fun it is. And this coming Sabbath, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the meaning of this feast. It does picture the thousand-year millennial reign. But we'll get more into it uh, this Sabbath about that. Because uh, this is a whole week long. It doesn't end until next Wednesday this year. Uh, are there any questions so far? All right, now let's read verse 40. This goes along with the question we had. And you shall take... You on the first day, the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you rejoice before God. Okay, what do you do with that? Look at verse 42. 
you're to dwell in booths. So what God said was you go out to the, the palm trees. Now, we don't have palm trees in North Carolina. And boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook. Well, maybe there aren't any willows around here. <clears throat> maybe we don't have any brooks. These are like weeping willows. You find them around creeks and brooks and streams and things like that. But what God said was take what is available to you and make a booth. In our day, a canvas tent. Take canvas. Take whatever is available to you. But it's not what is what the booth is made of. That, God doesn't care what it's made of. Make it out of plastic if you want to. But they didn't have plastic in those days. The idea is, it says, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. But remember, the strangers are to do it too. We read that. That your generations may know that I made Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So it was looking back at what how God had delivered them from bondage. Today, we've got false prophets who say God's holy days are bondage. No, this feast pictures God leading people out of bondage. They're no longer slaves. They're sitting under their own booth, and they're free. They don't even have to work. You, may, you realize the Israelites didn't have to work for 40 years. Now, if you have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to work five days a week, that's a lot more bondage than keeping the feast and living in tents for 40 years and not having to work. They didn't even have to be farmers because God would rain down food from heaven. I mean, they had it easy for 40 years. So this feast pictures being freed from bondage. And one day, you're going to have a glorified body. You're going to live in the kingdom of God. And you'll never, ever, ever, ever have to work at the sweat of your brow or the sweat of your face, the Bible says, ever again. Now, you'll be working. But it won't be working up a sweat. We'll be creating and so on. Let's get into Now, oh, let me show you something else here. Verse 41. Now, people say, but... Weren't these days done away at the cross? Weren't there some laws done away? Weren't there some ordinances done away? Verse 41 says, You shall keep it a feast to the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever. So <clears throat> if Protestant churches are correct in saying that some of God's law was abolished, whatever it was, it didn't include the Feast of Tabernacles. Because this is forever. So pray tell, how is it that people don't observe it? Now, let me say this. Almost all denominations do have camp meetings. But they have them in July when the kids are out of school. The Pentecostal Cleveland, Tennessee church that calls itself the Church of God, they do, I know for a fact. They have camp meetings like in July. The Lutheran church has a campground up here in the mountains. They have camp meetings. I know the Methodists do. I grew up Methodist at Juno, Lake Junalaska. They have a campground. They have camp meetings. Why is it that the churches believe, hey, let's have a camp meeting? But yet, God commanded a seven-day camp meeting, and they say, oh, it's been done away. Well, then why are they doing it in the summertime? Why are they doing it at all if they say it's been done away? So what this feast is, if, if we do it correctly, and we have the people to do it, it's a big week-long blowout. It's a big, it's a big party for a whole week, and it's a camp meeting where everybody takes off from work, we come together maybe in a resort area or something, and we just worship the Lord for a whole week. Now, that's the proper way to do it. And I'll tell you, it's a lot of fun. And another thing, too, you see people you haven't seen in years and years. Remember when the Jews would get together, people from different countries. Remember Acts chapter 2? They had people from all these many countries who came there to keep the holy days. Can you imagine seeing your, your cousins and... and uh, relatives that you haven't seen since the last feast. It's like a homecoming thing. God's feast were where the relatives would come together and be together once again. That's a wonderful thing. And that's what they did, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so when I've observed the Feast of Tabernacles, I would see people that I haven't seen, maybe in several years. Uh, and, and you'd get together and, and, and say, let's go out to eat together and let's have a feast. And we would talk. It is so much fun, I'm telling you. It'd be so good because we could have all our online students that don't even live out of the country or yeah. live on the other side of the country. They could come and it would be so much It would be wonderful. It's like a family reunion. That's exactly what it is. It's a big family reunion. We and and it's God's family. We could have a college reunion at the same time. We could have a college reunion and... A spiritual reunion, do it all at one time. We would turn Kannapolis upside down if we had 300, because it would be more than 300. You see, you take all of our graduates, and about all of them are married, and then they bring their husbands or wives 
and then they bring their kids, we would have probably four or 500 people celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles with us right here in Kannapolis. And it would make the front page of the local newspaper. Feast of Tabernacles celebrated. I mean, they, I've actually seen newspapers do things like that. They don't know what it is, but they'll come and say, what is this you call? What do you call it? Feast of Tabernacles. So they'll put it in their newspaper. It's called a fiesta. They'll come. Yeah, yeah. And, and here's what would happen. We would invite the local churches to come and check us out and see what we're doing. And a lot of pastors would persecute us and say, oh, they're putting people under the bondage of the law. Are you kidding? We're having so much fun. If this is bondage, let's keep doing it. In fact, we'd vote to do it another seven days. It'd be so much fun. The bondage is when the last day comes, you've got to go back to work <laughs> afterwards. That's bondage. But God's feast days are freedom, and they're fun. I've done them. I've done them with thousands of people. So I'm telling you, they are a lot of fun. But whatever was done away, if anything was done, if anything was done away at the cross, it says here, this feast is a statute forever. So forever means it wasn't done away. Are there any questions? Now, a booth is a temporary dwelling. Let me, again, answer more of that question by going to the book of uh, Nehemiah. Now, this, this Sabbath, I'm going to explain the conditions in the millennium itself because this does picture the millennium. Can I ask you to do me a favor? Uh -huh. Would you bring me that reference Bible right over there, please? I forgot to get it a moment ago. I'd appreciate that. In chapter 8 of Nehemiah, listen to this. Verse 14, they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Just that Bible is all I need. Yeah, no. And that they should publish and proclaim their cities, go forth to the mountain, fetch olive branches, thank you, and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of big trees. Why? Why? To make booths. That's all they had. They didn't have canvas in those days. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house. That's the best they could do in the courts, in the courts of the house of God, in the street. <laughs> Make a booth out there in the street, and the street of the gate of Ephraim, and in the Watergate street. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, and to that day had not the children of Israel done so. They'd kept the Feast of Tabernacles, but well, for whatever reason, they weren't dwelling in, in booths or tabernacles. And there was very great gladness. Also, day by day during the, the, the week-long feast, from the first day till the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. And if I do that, people accuse me of legalism. We need to learn the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly, according to the manner. Nehemiah 8, verses 14 through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> so they did dwell in those literal booths, and I'd like to see us have enough people where we do that again. You know, even the Assemblies of God have camp meetings. Jimmy Swagger got famous for being the camp meeting preacher. That's what he was called, the camp meeting preacher. And he'd go, he'd go to all the camp meetings and play his piano and get up and preach, and he got famous that way. So churches are all in favor of having camp meetings, but they won't do it in the month of October at the end of the harvest when God said to you, oh, that's done away. So they substitute their own camp meetings for the camp meeting that God told us to keep. There was, however, up in Alexandria, Virginia, a First Baptist Church that every October, they'd take the kids out of school, people would take off from work, and hundreds of them would get together and celebrate a week-long camp meeting. And a friend of mine up in Virginia said, I always wondered what they were doing in October. And she said, I wonder if that was the Feast of Tabernacles that that Baptist pastor had his church observing. <clears throat> now, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists keep only the weekly Sabbath, and they don't know what they're missing. They don't keep the annual Sabbath. You know what they're keeping this month? Halloween. Seventh-day Adventists who keep the weekly Sabbath, Ellen G. White, their founder, told one of their founders, told them it's okay to keep the, the holidays of the world, that you don't need to keep God's holy days. Now, what does this feast symbolize? All oh, that's my introduction. Now let's get into the message. What does this feast symbolize? Each of these days of God is a shadow or, modern word, foreshadow of something that is supposed to come to pass in the future. <clears throat> not all the days on God's calendar are holy days. The tenth day of the month of Abib was not a holy day. It was the day when they selected the lamb. And on that very day, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and everybody accepted him as the Messiah 
and unwittingly they accepted him as the Passover lamb. Four days later, on the preparation day, which is not a holy day, they killed the lamb. Christ, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. They sacrificed Christ at the, on the very day, at the very hour when they were sacrificing the lamb in the temple at 3 o'clock. Called the ninth hour in that day. Three days later, they harvested. Now, this is according to the records of the first century, which we still have record of. It's called the Bothusian records, the records of the family of Bothus, who, who was the ruling priestly family in the first century, in Jesus' day. We still have those records 2,000 years later. The Bothusians tell us when they offered the wave sheaf. Now, modern-day uh, rabbinical Jews, you know when they offer the wave They don't offer it, but do you know when they say the wave sheaf is? The 16th of the month of Nisan. <clears throat> That's not correct. The wave sheaf was always on at the day following the weekly Sabbath. Now, now the, the Pharisees wanted to keep the 16th of Nisan as the wave sheaf, and the Sadducees wanted to keep the Sunday following the weekly Sabbath. The Sadducees had it right. In fact, when you read uh, the four Gospels, who did Jesus jump on more than anybody else? He jumped on the Pharisees. He didn't have much to say to the Sadducees. But, brother, he jumped on the Pharisees. So the 10th day, Jesus fulfilled that by riding into Jerusalem. On the 14th day, he fulfilled the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. On the 15th day, what happened in the Old Testament? Egypt, they were in bondage, right? Israel left Egypt on the 15th day, the first day of unleavened bread. Now, seven weeks later is Pentecost. On that very day, Israel got the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Centuries and centuries later, the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit fell. So do you see God is fulfilling these holy days? But he has not yet fulfilled the autumn holy days. The first one is trumpets. Now that won't be fulfilled until you see those seven trumpets being fulfilled in our world when you know, all these horrible disasters are going to come during the day of the Lord. Now, let me show you that Jesus is the first of the first fruits. Well, I won't take time to. I'm going to give you the references. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and 23. Jesus is the first of the first fruits. Well, if he's the first, then who are the first fruits? James 1.18 says we are. We're the first fruits, pictured by the day of Pentecost. Jesus is the first of the first fruits. Now, trumpets occurs in the autumn. That that's the second coming, the day of atonement, prophetically foreshadows the whole world being atoned or reconciled to God. Now, you'll know when that happens because Jeremiah 31, verse 34 says, all, Nobody will say, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, says the Lord. You won't go down the street and say, Can I tell you about Jesus? Would you like, you don't, you know, people, we got people knocking on doors. Do you know Jesus? Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they do some weird stuff, but there are Baptists who get out and knock on doors, and they're actually sharing the true gospel. Do you know Jesus? Down in Mexico, this uh, some of these um, Americans went down there to do some missionary work, and they were out knocking on doors, knocked on this one door, and they said, Sir, do you know Jesus? And the Mexican said, Yes, I think he lives two doors down. Because down there they named their kids Jesus. But here in America, that works. But down there, you know, he thought it was the guy down the street. But he, God said, you won't say, know the Lord, for all shall know me. That's after the day of atonement has been fulfilled. Everybody will know Jesus. Then five days later, we have this day, the Feast of Tabernacles. I want to read to you from my, I got two reference Bibles here, and I want to read to you what this feast pictures. Now, remember, this Sabbath, I'm going to go into some of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible about the way it's going to be conditions in the millennium. Let's see here. Now here's what one of my reference Bibles says. The Feast of Tabernacles, prophetic as to the kingdom rest of Israel after her regathering and restoration, when the feast again becomes a memorial, not for Israel alone, but for all nations, Zechariah 14, 16. That's what the Schofield Reference Bible says. So that's picturing the kingdom age. Now, in, in this, this is a uh, Nelson Study Bible. Listen to what this says.
it says the Feast of Tabernacles will find its final fulfillment in Christ's thousand-year kingdom on earth. So the Feast of Tabernacles pictures the thousand years of the reign of God on the earth. Are there any questions so far? That's from the Nelson Study Bible. Any questions online there at all? Now, there's a little bit of a delay, so there might be one. Might be one coming. Now, let me, let me, you see, you know, Methodist and Baptist and Presbyterian and Lutheran churches just don't teach these things. They're preparing their people to celebrate Satan's holiday. This morning, I looked out across the street and I saw for the first time my neighbors across the street. There's a big picture of a dead guy hanging. Nothing, no meat on his bones, just bones, just skeleton. And that's supposed to be entertaining. Oh, preparing the children to celebrate Halloween, a day that glorifies death, but God's feast days glorify life. Now, Hebrews 10, 1 says this, the law having a shadow of good things to come. Passover pictures something good to come. Pentecost pictures the coming of the Holy Spirit, something good to come. The Feast of Trumpets pictures something good to come. Jesus is coming. The Feast of Tabernacles pictures something good to come. The King James says, having a shadow. In modern English, it foreshadows something is going to come. Now, let me go to Colossians here. You might say, well, you talked about this last year. Well, it's not the same scriptures. I'm giving you a little, little different scriptures. But God said, I want you to do this year after year after year after year until Jesus comes, and then you're going to do another thousand years. Why? Because God wants us to understand this. Now, when Christ does return, you're going to be ahead. Those of you who are keeping this holy day and all these feast days, you're going to be ahead of the whole church world who doesn't understand this. God said, I want you to rule. I want you to rule with me. How can we rule with him and we don't know what he's doing? I mean, if the governor of this state said, I want you to come up here to the state capitol, told you this, and I want you to help me rule this state, how do I do that? We're going to have to enforce the laws. But the fact of the matter is, until you know the state constitution, until you know what the state laws are, shoot, I couldn't do the job. I wouldn't be able to. But if Jesus came back and said, I'm going to make you a ruler, now go teach my people, the Feast of Tabernacles, could you do it? In springtime, if, if Jesus said, look, I'm, I'm putting you over the nation of India, go teach them Passover, would you know how? Mm -hmm. But you've got to do it year after year after year after year. That's why God said, keep doing it, keep doing it, until you learn this so thoroughly it's running out of your ears. And then when God sends you to another nation, you'll be able to say, I'm going to teach you how to do this. I've heard it taught now for 40 years. Now, y'all sit down and listen. So don't say, well, I hear this year after year after year. You're in training. All of you are in training to take over the world. Don't worry. We're not going to do it by the sword. That's up for Jesus to do that. We're not like Muslims. We're not going to go out and take a sword and go out and conquer cities. But when Jesus returns, he's going to give us those cities. We don't have to conquer them. You're over five cities. You're over ten cities. Maybe he puts you over an entire province or something. Maybe over a, a nation itself. Who knows what God's going to do. But if you don't learn it now, you won't go do it then. Do you have a question? It'd be nice if we all started teaching our fellow neighbors and our church members here in the United States this stuff. Yeah. Because Jesus said the greatest reward goes to those who obey and teach. But they don't know nothing about it, do they? Yeah. They don't understand it. I mean, we got people go to church every Sunday, and you ask them about this, and they'll say, the feast of what? Mm -hmm. But, brother, they know about Halloween. But what Christ isn't going to have us putting ghosts and goblins and demons out on our front porch. Easter too. Yeah, he's not going to have us doing that. Now, Colossians 2 talks about the holy days. The early church kept the holy days. Verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, which is after the tradition of men. Not God's law, men's laws. Um, verse 18 Let's see. Um, let me back up to verse 4. And this I say, lest any man beguile you. Don't let men beguile you. Don't let them deceive you. Uh, verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Don't do that. 
Now, verse 16, let no man judge you. See, the idea, they're judging them, not after the laws of God, but verse 20 mentions ordinances. Verse 21, touch not, taste not, handle not. After, verse 22, after the commandments and doctrines of men, not God. So Halloween is a doctrine of men. The idea that Jesus was born in December, that's a doctrine of men. All these things are doctrines of men. We are not to let, let verse 18, don't let any man beguile you in these areas. And the whole church world has done so. Now, verse 16, this proves the early church did keep the holy days. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink. The Greek says, uh, the Greek reads, ambrosai a imposai, which means in eating or in drinking. Let no man judge you in what you eat or drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath. The word days is not in the Greek, it just says the Sabbath. Why would these men who were beguiling them, these Gentile men, why would they be judging the church there in Colossae in respect to what they ate or drink? Because the Gentiles would say, you got to be a vegetarian now. A lot of Gentiles were ascetics. Verse 21, touch not, taste not, handle not. They were into asceticism. Well, then they got saved. Some of these people got saved. Now they had to eat a great big steak. And their Gentile neighbors were persecuting them. Or in drink. A lot of the ascetics said, oh, you can't touch a drop of wine. And they said, our Savior did. And they're sitting there drinking wine, eating steak. And their Gentile neighbors judged them. How dare you drink that glass of wine? Now, I grew up in a church that, man, the worst sin you could commit was to drink alcoholic beverages. And in church, about the only sermons I remember growing up was don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink. Now, I'm all against gluttony and drunkenness. But Jesus was accused of being a glutton because he ate meat. And he's, he was accused of being a wine bibber because he drank wine. Had he been drinking Coca-Cola, he couldn't have been accused of a wine bibber or goat's milk. And if all he had drunk was water, nobody would accuse him of being a wine bibber, but they saw him drinking wine. So they called him a wine bibber, which is the same as wino in, in American English, and that means a, a, a drunk. Yes, sir. They would accuse him of being a wine bibber because he turned water into wine. Yeah, you can turn water into wine, too. <laughs> and served it to other people. That's right. Amazing. But a Baptist would say that it was really grape juice. Yeah, I heard a Seventh-day Adventist preacher say that on television. He said he made 250 gallons of grape juice. <laughs> Read the Jewish Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Encyclopedia Biblica. These are Jewish encyclopedias. One is simply called the Jewish Encyclopedia. And look up wedding feasts and see what they drank at wedding feasts. They drank wine. To this day, part of the wedding ceremony is a glass of wine and after they drink the wine, the bridegroom, the bride drink wine. Remember what they do? They step on the glass. See? So wine, in fact, when a baby is winged, they put wine to his lips. From the time a baby is winged after birth until they die, wine is a part of their whole culture and religion. So Jesus didn't make grape juice. They'd have thrown him out. What do you do with all this grape juice? Get rid of that stuff. They drank wine. And if he made 250 gallons of it, there were a lot of people at that feast. And somebody said, that's better wine you served at the first. That's good wine. That <laughs> wasn't grape juice. <laughs> All right, any other questions? So let no man judge you in what you eat or drink in respect of a holy day. If they weren't keeping the holy days, why would they be judging you? It doesn't make sense. If I said to you, now don't you let anybody judge you in respect of the Wesak Festival, okay? You'd say, the what? What's the Wesak Festival? You mean you're not keeping the, none of you are keeping the Wesak Festival? No. Nope. Do you know what, does anybody even know what that is? Isn't that what the, the witches and the Wiccans used? No, I don't know. See, she doesn't know what it is. No, I don't even know when it is or what it is. Or Nobody what. has ever judged her in respect to the Wesak Festival because she's never kept it. But brother, if you ever start keeping it, then you'd get judged, wouldn't you? Well, let no man judge you in respect of a holy day. They were keeping the holy days. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Wesak Festival is, and you're just busting to know it's Buddha's birthday. But you've never observed Buddha's birthday. And nobody's going to judge you in respect of his birthday because you don't pay attention to it. But the Gentiles were now keeping Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and, these, and their unconverted Gentile family, uh, uh, kinfolks and so on, were, what are you 
you're doing, you're putting leavening out of your house. Why are you doing that? So they were getting judged. Or the new moon. Now, they use the Roman calendar like we do, January through December. But to keep the holy days, they would go out in the evening and look for the new moons. And when the seventh new moon came, okay, it's time to start God's feast. And then it says, or the Sabbath. So they were still doing that. Yes, sir. Well, we can't even be accused of celebrating Jesus' birthday because we, it wasn't no Christmas. That's right. <laughs> so don't let men, don't let men judge you. These were unconverted Gentile men who were doing that. Now let's go to Acts 18 if you have your Bibles. Now theologians, this we're not told here what feast that Paul was referring to, but theologians believe it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 18. Acts what? Uh, Acts chapter 18. 1818, remember that way, Acts 1818. Paul tarried there a good while in that Greek city. Verse 17, all the Greeks, you see, he's in a Greek city. And it's interesting here. He came to Ephesus, another Greek-speaking city, and left them there, verse 19, and he entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. But he's in a Gentile city. Now, verse 20, when they desired him to tarry a longer time, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem. But I'll return again if God will. And he sailed from where? Ephesus. Now he's telling these Gentiles, I've got to keep this feast. He didn't just say, I want to go down there so there will be a lot of Jews there to preach to. He said, I've got to keep this feast. The Greek word poyo means to keep, celebrate, or observe. So the word keep could be translate, celebrate. I, I must by all means celebrate this feast. And I've heard people say the only reason Paul went down there was because there was a lot of people there and he preached the gospel to them. He said he was keeping those feasts. A theologians believe this is the Feast of Tabernacles. Also in John 7, there it's mentioned. So that's the New Testament. Yeah. John 7, 2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says the Feast of the Tabernacles came and Jesus told his brothers and sisters, go you up unto this feast. Now, why would he tell people to go up to the feast if he didn't want us to keep them? It's in John 7. <clears throat> now, the day of the Lord is the time just prior, including, and just after Christ's return. In conclusion, I want you to go to Zechariah, if you have your Bibles. The day of the Lord is not just the exact 24-hour day Jesus returns. The day of the Lord is the time just prior to his second coming and at the time of his second coming and what falls right after his second coming. It's that general time frame. Zechariah is the next to the last book of the Old Testament. And look at verse chapter 9 and verse 14. And the Lord shall be seen over them... And his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet. Now, when does that occur? Not the first coming. The trumpet is sounded at the second coming. So the Lord will be seen. Revelation chapter 1 says, Every eye shall see him. So this is the second coming of Jesus. And that's referred to as the day of the Lord. Look at verse 16. The Lord their God shall save them when? In that day. And they'll say, verse 17, How great is his goodness, how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine, the maids. Not new grape juice, new wine. The word wine in Hebrew, if you look it up, in Strong's Concordance means an, an intoxicant or an alcoholic beverage. It actually refers to it that way. There's several words for wine, but they mean a literal wine, not grape juice. That's used in the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at chapter... Uh, 10 verse 6 I will strengthen the house of Judah and I'll save the house of Joseph that's the other 10 tribes and I will bring them again to place them back in the land of Palestine for I have mercy upon them they shall be as though I had not cast them off I am the Lord their God and will hear them verse 8 the second line says I have redeemed them so this is going to happen when Christ returns he's bringing all the tribes of Israel back into the promised land that doesn't start till after Christ returns Look at chapter 12 and verse 3. And in that day, the day of the Lord, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. Verse 4, in that day, I'll smite the horse with astonishment. Verse 6, in that day, I'll make the governors of Judah, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> verse 7, it talks about the glory of the house of David. David will be resurrected in that day. 
when the trumpet sounds. Verse 8, In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is a feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God. They're going to be ruling. The house of David will be ruling over this earth. Guess what? You're going to be a part of that. You say, wait a minute, I'm not Jewish. Well, Revelation 3.21 says you can sit on Jesus' throne, and the only people who can sit on that throne are those who are descended from David. So guess what? You've been adopted into the family of David, too. A lot of people miss that. Verse 9, it shall come to pass in that day, I'll seek to destroy all the nations that came against Jerusalem. America better not ever turn against Jerusalem. And verse 10, it says, look at the fifth line down. They shall look upon me, says Christ, of whom they have pierced. You see that? Now that's interesting. They're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. Verse 11, in that day there will be a great morning in Jerusalem. In that day. Chapter 13, verse 1. In that day there will be a fountain open to the house of David. Verse 2. And it shall come to pass, in that day I'll cut off all the names of the idols. So when, that's the day when Jesus straightens out the mess down here. Verse 4. It shall come to pass, in that day the prophets shall be ashamed of every one of his vision. These guys on television that says, send me your biggest bill out of your wallet and I'll send you a green piece of cloth. Yeah. Or this one guy, Peter Popoff, will send you miracle spring water. Now, what makes it a miracle? I don't know. He prays over it or something, I guess, and it's supposed to give you a miracle. Well, now let's go to chapter 14, verse 1. What is that day? Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day. What day? The day of the Lord. Upon the Mount of Olives. Now, in Acts chapter 1, it says, The way you saw him go into heaven, he shall so come in like manner. He left from the Mount of Olives, he's coming back to the very spot, the Mount of Olives. Verse 5, the last two lines, the Lord my God shall come. Jesus is not just the Son of God, he is the Lord our God and all the saints with thee. Guess what? Those who have died are coming back too and those of us who are alive and remain will come back with Jesus. Well, how's it, how can we come back with him? Because we're going to be caught up to meet him, to rendezvous in the clouds, then we're coming down with him. Now, if you live in Israel at that time, you'll just be caught up and come right back down. <laughs> but if you live in North Carolina, you'll be caught up and you'll go that way toward Jerusalem. And if you live in China and you're a Christian, you'll be caught up this way and you'll head toward you'll head west toward Jerusalem. But we're then once we rendezvous over Israel, we're all coming back down with him. So you got one here and one there and one here and one there. And then we all come together and we come back with him to Jerusalem. First, are there any questions? Verse 8, it shall be in that day that living waters will go forth from Jerusalem. Living waters. Running water. I asked a geology professor. It just dawned on me. There must be a river, an underground river there. I said, is there any, has geologists, because he was a geology professor, have geologists ever determined that there's an underground river underneath the Temple Mount? He said, oh, yeah, there's a huge river under there. Well, in Revelation, it talks about these earthquakes that are going to occur. When those earthquakes occur, it's going, and remember the Mount of Olives will be laid flat when Christ returns. It's going to be an earthquake, and part of it will go this way, and part of it will go that way at Zechariah 14. And when that occurs, that river will be opened up, and there'll be right under the Temple Mount, this huge river will be pouring out. That's all during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Verse 9, the Lord shall be king over the earth in that day, you see. Now, verse 16, and it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep Halloween. No, it doesn't say that, does it? No more ghosts and goblins and hanging out skeletons out in your front porch. Yuck. But we're going to be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles all during the kingdom age. And it shall be that whoso will not come up, I ain't going to do that, people will say, of all the families of the earth, Germans, Russians, Chinese, Africans, Eskimos, Australians, who have I left out? That's about everybody. Europeans, the Arabs, of all the families of the earth, unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, upon them shall be no rain. Drought. Now Egypt says we don't need rain, we got the Nile River. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, if they, they still won't come, then they'll be hit with the plague. Do you think God means business? 
God's serious. You keep these holy days. He's serious. <clears throat> Wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. All these heathen nations are going to be converted. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. If you'll give me just three more minutes, I'm going to read one more thing to you. In Isaiah chapter 2, this will be our segue into this weekend's message. It says in verse 2, It shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains. Now, you ask any Bible scholar and check any commentary, a mountain in Bible symbolism is a kingdom. A mountain is a Bible, uh, in Bible symbolism, is a kingdom. So the mountain of God's house, his kingdom, will be established in the top of all the other kingdoms of the world. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, and he'll teach us, uh, teach us his ways, and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. So during the thousand years, guess what? People are going to be taught God's law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, Jesus Christ, shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Now, actually, the word and there in Hebrew is the word until. They mistranslate it. It says, he will judge these people until or rebuke them until they beat their swords into plowshares. There's going to be a time, a process involved. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And guess what most people want to do? They just want to go to heaven and retire. This is going to happen here on this earth. It's going to happen on this earth. I'm going to conclude with chapter 2. Verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Not Castro, not Putin, not even the American president. Jesus Christ alone will be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Verse 17 says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Verse 18, the idols he'll utterly abolish. That's never happened. And then finally, in verse 20, in that day, the day of the Lord, in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made each one for himself to worship into the moles and to the bats, meaning even your gold and silver will one day be utterly worthless. So what is this Feast of Tabernacles? It symbolizes that after Christ is returned, pictured by trumpets, and the whole world is atoned, when the devil's put away and all the world is atoned to Christ, to God the Father through Christ, now we can sit down and party. On the 10th day of this month is a day of fasting. The whole world is going to be fasting and repentance. Five days later, pictures a time of feasting because now we can rejoice. And for a thousand years, we're going to have a most beautiful, wonderful world without any more war. It's over. The Arabs will now get along with the Jews. It'll be very interesting when Passover comes around to see the Arabs and the Jews washing each other's feet. Yeah, I don't have to deal with God. That's the work of God. Are there any questions? Now, just remember, if you have any questions about whether or not you should keep it, hey, I'm as Gentile as anybody in this room. I'm, I'm solid German. That's utterly Gentile. And... And I'm keeping these holy days because my Messiah is Jewish and he says, you do what I do. John chapter 7, <clears throat> he certainly kept the Feast of Tabernacles. We're keeping it the best we can. <clears throat> I wish we had hundreds of people where we could have a big camp meeting. Do I have any questions online? Well, it's good to see everybody here. Now, today is, now, what do you do during the next seven days? You just spend time doing what you normally do, read God's Word, but you might want to read about the millennium. I suggest you read chapter 2, again, of Isaiah, chapter 11 of Isaiah, chapter 35 of Isaiah. Read the last chapter of Isaiah. <clears throat> read the last uh, <clears throat> nine chapters of Ezekiel. Read about the millennium. Read chapter 20 of Revelation. <clears throat> 
where he's going to set up a thousand year reign. And I'll give you plenty of things to do over the next several days. Now this Sabbath, I'm going to be going through the conditions of the millennium and we're going to be really paying attention to what it's going to be like. And this is, and, and we're going to have fun with that because you know what I'm looking forward to during the millennium? Spending time with my relatives that have passed away. I doubt that. Maybe. I doubt it. Yeah, maybe not all of our relatives will be there, but you might be surprised for some good people that that maybe they didn't have the truths you and I have, but they still had faith in Christ. And so, uh, you know, the thief on the cross wasn't a very good man. He probably didn't keep the holy days ever. After all, he was a thief. And he admitted he was a thief. But yet Jesus said, you're going to be with me. So I'm expecting to see my folks, my parents, now, let me tell you this, and I'm going to let you go. Next week, a week from today, is the last holy day. It's the eighth day. And the message that I'm giving on that day is one of the most beautiful messages. I only preach it once a year, except I do mention it in class when we get to Lesson 20. But that message is one of the greatest messages that have ever fallen on human ears. And if you've got anybody who died and they and you knew they weren't saved, you need to hear this message. If you know anybody who died who just didn't understand his need for Jesus and he died unsaved, you need to hear this message. So make sure that you don't miss next Thursday, a week from today. But also try to be here this Sabbath too because we want to get more into the, the meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's good to see you folks here. Deborah, good to see you again. I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you. Any, any questions at all? We have any questions? Okay, we are dismissed.